In a previous video, I explained why I thought Facebook should use Bitcoin SV. Uh, in a nutshell, that is basically the idea that, uh, bit, first of all, Bitcoin SV will scale globally. So there is no upper bound on the scaling potential of Bitcoin SV. Uh, in this video, I'm just going to refer to it as Bitcoin because um, it's the original Bitcoin protocol, or at least the closest thing that we have to it. And it's distinguished from Bitcoin Core in a number of different ways, but particularly in the sense that the way that we scale is simply to not have a maximum block size and the economics works itself out in a similar way to the internet, that the internet doesn't prescribe a maximum data volume or something like this, that businesses just have to build uh, software and infrastructure to make the internet scale. Fundamentally, it's the same thing with Bitcoin. And so this is what we're doing with Bitcoin SV. Um, so first of all, it scales. This is a, a key reason to use it. Um, and for people that are technical, uh, there's a very simple way to understand why Bitcoin scales when Ethereum doesn't. Um, and the difference is one of parallelization. So for people that asked me this in my previous video, what I mean is because of this UTXO model of Bitcoin, the way that you can validate transaction as Bitcoin in, in Bitcoin is basically to simply look at the UTXOs that they're spending, and then validate them means basically running these scripts, and you can you can distribute these transactions across uh, many cores, uh, and you can validate many of them in parallel, because even if you validate them in a different order, you're going to get the same answer, which is whether they were valid or not. In Ethereum, this isn't the case, because Ethereum has this state model. Um, if you run the, the validation in a different order. Um, it might impact some variable that's used in another one. And so you might run out of money before another one. And so something that is valid might not be valid if you run it in a different order. Um, and, or you might get a different answer, like the balance of something might be different if you run them in a different order. Effectively, what this means is that Ethereum is extremely difficult to parallelize. Um, and so it has a scaling bottleneck that's built in at a protocol level. So I'm comparing Bitcoin to Ethereum just because Ethereum is so popular. I'm not familiar enough with Libra to, to go into that one in detail, um, but I will say that uh, I am unconvinced that they've really solved the scaling problem by reading their white papers. Um, if they can go up to a thousand transactions per second, I don't think they quite understand the original Bitcoin because there is no upper limit on the number on the transaction volume of the original Bitcoin. So it, it's a completely different uh, you know, uh, sort of scaling property. So this is property number one, scaling. It will actually work at Facebook scale and bigger. This is very important. The second property is that uh, Bitcoin is, is easy to comply with the law because everything is traceable. Fundamentally, you can comply with things like money transmitter regulations, banking regulations, and things like this, uh, and securities regulations and all this stuff. So it, you, you can simply trace whatever you need to trace and track whatever you need to track to comply with the law. And so this distinguishes it from some of the other ones uh, that are trying to make it impossible to comply. Um, we're doing the opposite. I mean, the original Bitcoin protocol uh, is compliant. There's nothing illegal about it. It's not a security or anything like this. Um, but also uh, you can build businesses on it that are compliant with all sensible laws that I've ever heard of. Um, so these are two reasons why Facebook should be should be interested in using Bitcoin SV. And so what I want to describe in, in this video is actually a bit more of the product side about what it would look like for Facebook to actually adopt Bitcoin SV. Um, so I, I think of this as, so I've given a number of recent presentations and videos about the subject, which I will link to, which is specifically focused on how can, uh, how can we make an own your data paradigm for the internet? And we can distinguish this from the way that Facebook works sort of as follows. So when people sort of log in and upload data to, to Facebook, either it's because they're posting an image, they're writing an article, or they're messaging their friends or whatever. Um, what, what Facebook is doing is Facebook reads that data and then uses this information to create a platform that they sell to advertisers to let advertisers sell targeted ads to the end user. So Facebook sees all of your data. And they say they value privacy, but I've asked several audiences this and no one that I've asked, now granted I did talk with niche audiences and haven't pulled the general population, but certainly within the circles where I run, um, literally no one thinks Facebook does a good job of protecting their privacy and literally everyone uh, thinks fa Facebook does a bad job, that they are not protecting their, your privacy uh, because Facebook as a company sees everything. 
So the, the thing is, it's going to be very difficult for Facebook to switch out of this because they have a very good business model and they're earning lots of money from, from this model. Um, they're monetizing their users' data is effectively what's going on. I, I don't think anybody inside the company could somehow be confused about this. I mean, that's clearly what's going on is the users upload their data, Facebook knows what it is, and Facebook earns all of the money by creating this advertising platform. So how are we, you know, we, in order for Facebook to realistically switch to something new, to pivot to a new business model, I mean, we're talking like a radical change for, for the nature of Facebook to switch to something new. It's going to have to be not just something different. I mean, they're not going to just switch out of ideology. It's going to have to be something that actually makes business sense, that they're actually going to ultimately earn more money from this. And I think that they probably will. So um, when you monetize content correctly, um, I'm pretty sure there is a, a vast amount of untapped potential here uh, to properly monetize content that Facebook can benefit from. So I think what Facebook should do fundamentally is pivot to a model whereby the users own their data and they sell it. And Facebook creates the distribution platform that they charge money for for, for end users to actually reach the destination. Um, if Facebook did that, Facebook could earn, let's just say, let's just pick a percentage or something like this, let's say 10% of the revenue from the content. Um, I think if I'm right about this, the scope of this is much larger. I, I don't have any numbers, so you just have to just take this as an idea. Um, I don't have numbers because it's very hard to compute stuff like this, but I think the scale of this would be a lot, a lot bigger qualitatively for the simple reason that when you look at content funded by ads, it sucks. I mean, you know, the, the, the content that you consume, I mean, just compare like when you actually purchase a book or something like this versus most of the free content. Most of the free content is really terrible. So looking at either Facebook or Twitter or something like this, and I complain about Twitter a lot, but as best I can tell, it applies evenly across all of these ad-funded social networks. What's going on is the users, what they really get out of this by creating content on these platforms are attention, not discovering the truth. So attention is, is fine, but you can monetize it. You, you can do attention differently. I mean, what if you had affiliate systems and referral systems and things like this to monetize attention? You could, do, you could use money for attention too. And what if there, you, you made it easier for people to actually sell uh, content? I think there's a, a potential market here that's been only, just completely missed because we didn't have Bitcoin. It, it wasn't possible to simply sell an article for one cent, five cent, 10 cents, 25 cents, 50 cents, or something like this in the mid 2000s because Bitcoin didn't exist. And if you try to use legacy payment systems, they don't go low enough. It wasn't even possible to try to do something like this. Um, and when you realize you, you can, you can fund some content this way, you don't necessarily, because some people are worried that if you have micropayments that you don't want the user to be burdened with having to make a decision. First of all, I don't think that they're really that burdened as we can see with many of the, the proofs of concept of this micropayments model that we're doing. Uh, I'll just pitch some of the apps that use money button apps like, uh, Twitch, Wayblock, city on chain, look at the apps using money button. They have very small payments and users pay them. So I think the idea that users won't make micropayments is actually first and foremost a myth. But even if you believe this, um, it's not like you have to make it where the user actually thinks about every single payment. The users can make larger payments and then the payments can be distributed amongst various parties automatically. So you can still have micropayments um, peer to peer without necessarily the user having to actually think about it. So in any case, the point is that you monetize content with, with fundamentally selling it. And a lot of people think this isn't going to work. I'll tell you everything that we've learned so far from MoneyButton from yours.org. People will pay for content. To think that they won't, I think, is, is one of the biggest myths on the internet. I mean, people will pay for things that are worth paying for. The reason why they won't pay for the free trash on Twitter is because it's trash that isn't worth paying for. So that's why they're not going to pay for that stuff. Um, you, just, you just start charging money for all of the trash that's free. No one's going to pay money for it. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is create an opportunity for content creators that know how to create stuff that's actually good and monetize it with paywalls and other mechanisms that are fundamentally linked to a paywall where people are ultimately selling something and allow them to monetize it in new ways. I could give you tons of ideas, but just to give you an example, um, you know, uh, empower things like editors to earn a share. Empower things like a curator to earn a share. If everybody gets their share by pu putting in their fraction of the work, you can monetize things in ways that are just unlike anything that used to exist. You can turn businesses like a newspaper into a social platform where anybody can be an editor, anybody can be a curator, and join a social newspaper, whereby everything's funded with, with actual payments for stuff. 
and the money goes to everyone that contributes in a fully social way, so it's not a business. Um, but everyone who can contribute value to this platform in the form of helping create high quality content actually benefits from this stuff. Now, people will pay for this stuff because for the same reasons people pay for stuff in the real world. People pay for education. People pay for books. Okay, people pay for anything that's valuable to themselves, they'll pay. And they'll actually pay a lot of money. The more related it is to their own future advancement, so things like higher education, people spend a lot of money on that stuff because they believe that it's actually worthwhile. You create something that someone believes is that worthy, they'll pay money for it. And I think there's a simple way to think about this. Um, um, I've had discoveries throughout my life, usually somewhat randomly, but I've noticed that by learning more, I can actually accelerate this. Things where I learn something new that changes my life. I am willing to pay for that stuff, okay? I'm willing to pay for something that improves the quality of my life. I don't pay for stuff like Twitter because Twitter doesn't improve my life. It makes my life worse. Um, Twitter effectively misinforms people because it empowers all these manipulators to go out there and misinform everyone. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to pay for that. But in any case, imagine a world where we're so good at selecting this high quality content that A, you, you have access to high quality for pay content. When you pay for it, you are absolutely convinced, oh my gosh, yes, I just paid $100 for this piece of content, but I would have happily paid $10,000 because it was worth so much to me and changed my life so dramatically. And then imagine having an experience like this all of the time because we're so good at this, we're so good at selecting the best content that you encounter lots of content like this that is expensive, but, you, but is absolutely worth paying for. And when you consume this content, it is worthwhile because you learn something or gain something so beneficial that either it's a form of consumption that you're just willing to pay for, or it's like a capital good where you learn something so useful you immediately get, begin to profit right away from this content. That's what we're talking about here. And this is being completely missed with this ad-funded paradigm because with everything having to fit into this ad-funded model, the stuff that does well in the ad-funded model is clickbait. It's the stuff that sounds good on the surface of it so that you click through, look at the content, also see an ad next to it. That's clickbait. It's the stuff with a good headline and the substance of it is irrelevant. So this is why the quality of content is so low. This ad-funded model encourages attention-grabbing content to the expense of substance and truth and everything that actually matters. So we need to add in these new business models. So if I'm right about this, there are new models that Facebook can adopt that they will be able to profit from. And I'm pretty sure the market for this, when you understand the vision that I'm trying to sketch out here, that the content is going to be so much better. It, it is expensive, but it's going to feel cheap and it's actually going to make your life better regularly. You're going to pay a lot of money for this and Facebook takes whatever X percentage of this. This will end up being actually larger than their ad funded model right now. And so a realistic way, I think, uh, for Facebook to pivot, or let's say, I mean, it, it's a bit speculative because there's no way to know the market that I'm describing will actually exist in, in, until it either does or we fail continuously for all time to ever create such a thing. But if I am right about this, the, the business opportunity is not that far off. It's like on the uh, like individual years from now, we'll be able to pull this off and be able to create com completely new businesses that just, just don't currently exist uh, that use these ideas. Um, so anyway, so Facebook should, should adopt this. And so the way this would work at sort of a, a product or a technical level would be uh, what they should do is they should adopt the types of technology we, we've just built into Money Button. So we're building in all the fundamental uh, technologies, particularly things like signatures and encryption uh, on chain. So that allow the user to have their own, own their identity and publish content in a way that is completely independent of any particular company that because the content is actually on the blockchain, um, the user has access via their keys. And there's a bunch of user experience problems which we have either already solved or are solving right now. Uh, we can just go into details on this in a future video or anybody interested in this, obviously contact me. Um, in theory, this video will be seen by someone at Facebook if we're lucky. Um, but in any case, all these are solvable issues. We're, we're solving all the user experience issues and the technical issues. So the user will own their own identity. They will publish content to the blockchain independent of any particular company. But what will happen is the way the company is monetized by, by providing services sort of in and around all this content. The users do own their content and the users sell content to their audience. It can be licensing or something like this to renting or whatever. You, I mean, every type of business model you can imagine is, is possible. Uh, you know, we're, we're just using you know, Bitcoin for payments and for the data and for contracts. 
So you can imagine all sorts of things like licensing and things like this. All this are possible. And I'm sure these things will play an important role in all this stuff. So leveraging technologies like encryption, you can have things like where the user is able to actually distribute content to exactly the people that they want, which probably are going to be basically people that, that pay money for stuff. So the user can publish stuff for free if they want to, but they can encrypt things and allow people to buy access by buying a key that decrypts the content. Okay? From an end user experience, it's going to work similar to how it already works. Um, the user will just swipe money button to buy something and it, they'll just see it. And so they're, they don't know what's going on under the hood. But the user experience will actually be very good because by swiping money button and just seeing the content that you want. Like to give you an example, um, imagine you're on Facebook and you, uh, your friend publishes something. And so the way you would see something published by your friend and it would show you like a title and an image and a preview of the, uh, like a paragraph showing you content. It would say like swipe money button $1 to purchase the entire content. You swipe money button and the rest of the content is revealed. Either it's a video or whatever it is. But the user experience of that would actually be quite good. That by building payments and stuff into this and all this technology into Facebook directly, that the user experience would be way better than everything else. I mean, maybe they wouldn't even bother to exit Facebook to go find a book on Amazon because the content inside Facebook is so compelling that they're paying $100 a day to just read the content or, or watch the content or listen to the content inside of Facebook itself. And Facebook is getting X percentage of this, okay? So the user can still own it. And, and, and the user will own it in the sense that if they want to leave Facebook, they can, okay? So they can log into another service provider or something like this and still have all their content. But things like features and, and things like this will be different. So there'll be, there'll be you know, differentiation between platforms, but the content itself is properly fully owned by the user, okay? Um, so all this stuff is possible using Bitcoin SV and, and we're building exactly these technologies into Money Button itself right now. So in a nutshell, the way I imagine Facebook would do this is you would want to, of course, please uh, integrate with Money Button. Uh, you, you may do this. If anybody at Facebook watches this, please get in touch. We're happy to talk about these things and, and show you how we've solved all these problems that you're going to yourselves have to solve. Whether you use Money Button or not, I think you'll find that uh, using Bitcoin SV is a realistic way to, to solve this because what we're doing is actually going to work at scale and it's going to scale better than Libra and you're not going to have the legal issues that you have with Libra. So um, I've said this elsewhere, I'll keep saying it. Um, I would be surprised if Libra ultimately works out. I think you guys have made some missteps with respect to both the law and the scalability of it. And I think the original Bitcoin protocol already solved everything that matters. What you should be doing is applying this protocol within Facebook. And when you understand how this works in, a, in, you know, in an economic way and that the, the way the scaling works is basically a non-issue, um, you know, a company like Facebook can help us you know, create software and infrastructure and things like this, but there's no theoretical problem, that it's just a matter of doing it, um, that there's nothing stopping us except for, um, uh, you know, basically time. Uh, you know, we have to continue to build applications and get users and solve these, these uh, solvable technical issues, but in any case, it's just a matter of doing it. Um, I think Facebook would find that you can, th that you, doing this on Bitcoin SV is, is both workable and is gonna have fewer issues than building your own. Um, and it's actually gonna work. So, all right, so that's it. Um, that's all I have to say about that. In a nutshell, I think that, uh, I think Facebook can build these technologies uh, using Bitcoin SV into Facebook. Um, and uh, if we're lucky, uh, they'll understand what I'm saying and uh, we'll either get in touch with us or we'll just do it without us having to talk with them uh, because this is actually going to work. All right, thank you very much for listening.